Tonight we have Matt with Prototyping Cryptographic Protocols in Python with Charm. Thank you. All right. So uh, what is Charm? Why did I use that word? So Charm is actually the name of a Python framework that uh, came out of JHU. It uses a mix of Python and C, and uh, it's used for prototyping cryptographic protocols. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to go over a number of cryptographic primitives, and I uh, intend to demo how some of them work in Charm, just so that you can get an idea of how you could play with some of this yourself. Um, and some of these will be ones you're familiar with, perhaps some not so much. So uh, let's start, get started with that. All right, so um, some of the basic primitives in Charm um, are block ciphers and math. <laughs> so, um, so as far as block ciphers are concerned, they include DES, triple DES, and AES. Um, it, it does also have stream ciphers. I just didn't really look too much into them. But uh, it's going to be a lot of back and forth in the microphone. OK, so um, I just put basically as a, a um, scratch pad here uh, a bunch of Python code that we can use to demo some of this. So I'm going to um, explain a little bit about what this is. So first, I'm just going to. Uh, just convince you that uh, we, it does support AES encryption and decryption. Um, here I'm just doing an example of CBC mode. Um, and when you create a new AES object, uh, the first argument is the key, the second is the mode, and the third is uh, the IV as applicable. Um, so Yellow Submarine was, it's a bit of a shout out to the Meta Sound challenges. They uh, like to have a lot of music references in their challenges, and that was their favorite AES key, apparently. So it's become my favorite AES key. Uh, not in production, but uh, just like it's a convenient one for examples. It happens to work out to be 16 characters, so that's nice. All right. Uh, so I'm going to jump into the console. Uh, just. And let's see. I'm just gonna restart it real quick. Let's that. Okay. So hold on my moment. I guess that would be nice. It's intended for uh, questions. I'm not sure if, uh, yeah. I mean, Fred, what do you think about this? I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Makes your life easier. Yeah. I was when I first saw the setup here. I was like, uh, don't make sense. Somebody like, do you know how to turn these off? I don't know how to turn these off. Can you do that one on off right there. Excellent. Yep. Thank you. All right. That's a lot better. All right. Here. OK, so um, first I'm just going to copy some imports. Or you know what? It might be just faster for me to type. <laughs> so from so the, the uh, structure of Charm is that as a um, some of the, the core stuff is under core, um, and then crypto AES. I will import the AES class. Oh. Oopsies, what did I miss? Oh, crypto. Ha. Thank you. Hmm. Maybe it's a. Uh,
Oh. It should be. Um, <laughs> I swear this was just working. Um, huh. Let's see. So. Oh. Oh, actually. Let me just make sure that. Oh, no, wait. It's not. Okay. Okay. Um, Let me just make sure that we can do some of the other ones too. <laughs> so it would be a real shame if the other demos don't work. Okay, so. Oh dear. All right, very good. Okay, so at least that one works. All right. So perhaps um, you'll take my word for it that Yes, works properly. Um, as you can see, also uh, we have to import uh, padding, so uh, it's not going to just assume what padding you want. It has uh, PKCS7 padding included. So um, if you just look at the code, uh, we'll create a new AES object. We create a PKCS7 padding object, and then we can encrypt uh, sample messages um, and. One thing to know also, and this is fairly common I've noticed with most implementations in software is that uh, anytime you want to uh, decrypt, if, if you're doing both encryption and decryption on the same, in the same process, you need to create a separate instance of the object. So you notice that uh, before we decrypt, I create a new one uh, with the same key and IV. Um, and yeah, trust me, it works. <laughs> All right, um, so move back to the slides a little bit. Okay, so as far as math is concerned, um, some core uh, mathematical objects are integer groups, elliptic curve groups, and pairing groups. So for integer groups, there are Schnorr groups and RSA groups. Schnorr groups are uh, groups that are used for discrete log-based uh, crypto systems, uh, they have the property of being uh, in a multiplicative group with a large, uh, of a large prime order. So it's a large prime order subgroup of a uh, prime field. And RSA groups are the groups that you use for RSA. Um, and not just RSA, there are other crypto systems that we'll see that use this same group. Uh, so, yeah, we already got RSA group here, um, and so you can create an instance just by calling RSA group, and then it will allow you to just generate a new one. So there's a pram gen method, and say 1024. And uh, that's just outputting the prime factors that uh, make up the modulus. And the 1024 in this case is the size of the primes. It's not the final modulus. So this will be a 2048-bit modulus. Um, and all the groups support getting random values. So you can do group.random. And uh, you can multiply. Oh, I think it's the other way, other side. No, maybe not. The other groups, they do. Okay. So anyway. Oops. Okay. So the elliptic curves, so both elliptic curves and pairing groups are, uh, well, Pairing groups are elliptic curves, but these elliptic curves are uh, more the standard curves that uh, I think they include the standard NIST curves. Uh, I don't recall if they, which ones they require, uh, other ones they um, include. Uh, these two files that I just mentioned um, are just put out, pointed out here is because this is how they split up uh, their elliptic curve implementation. So the ec curve.py just specifies 
which curve it is. So it has just a huge list of variables or um, so, for example, prime 256v1 is, I believe, the, the NIST 256-bit prime, uh, P256. Um, and EC group will implement all the group operations, um, or at least provide the interface to the group operations. Everything should be uh, implemented in C. So we'll get the... Uh, uh, shoot, where is it? Uh, toolbox. So we'll first import from EC curves a prime uh, 256 V1. And from EC group, We'll get the EC group class. And now we'll have uh, our group equals EC group of prime 256 V1. And we can check things like group order. So that's how big the curve is. And we can get a random point, P. And this one, I know we can multiply. So we can do um, point wise multiplication. Um, we could add points. So uh, if we make another random point, Q, And we can compute P plus Q. So I'm talking mostly about these um, math basics just because, um, so the whole idea here is uh, if at any point you, you find out about some crypto system that you don't know of an existing implementation, you want to start working with it. Um, so if, if you're, this is the more lower level one where you want to implement um, maybe some new scheme that uses elliptic curves, you can, um, and I misspelled pairing. <laughs> um, you can uh, use elliptic curves or pairing curves. Um, was anybody here for the Pythia talk yesterday, by any chance? Yeah, so um, I suspect that, I haven't actually tested this, but I suspect that it'd be possible to implement that scheme using charm because um, you have access to pairings and uh, from what little I could see all you need are hashes and elliptic curve pairings um, but I could be wrong about that okay so that's that's all like basic all the basics um, now we're gonna get into what they call schemes so um, we'll talk about a few of these um, the first being public key cryptography so we've got RSA and Pi A uh, how many of you are, are familiar with Pi A? Anybody? Okay, so Pi A is, um, uses an RSA group, but it has a, a neat property that uh, the private key trapdoors discrete log, so you can have an additively homomorphic scheme um, and actually get back what the exponent is. So, um, when you use the Pi class, Pi A class, uh, you can encrypt values of numbers and uh, add them together or multiply them by scalars. So let's take a look at that. Okay. So we'll again import from charm that schemes. It's under a public key en encryption and then uh, PK Inc. Pi ninety nine, and we'll import Pi ninety nine. And if we call, we'll call lowercase Pi Pi ninety nine. Oh, right, <laughs> I forgot. Um, so we need the uh, RSA group object. So 
Um, we'll just create a new one here. And then we can do key generation. It'll give us both a public key and a private key. We'll specify our security parameter, which is just bit size. And so that we got our public key, which you can see. Um, so it's a, um, a generator G and modulus N, and then it also has N squared. That's what the N2 is. Um, and private key is this lambda in U value. Um, which allows us for doing the trapdoor of discrete log. And so if we want to encrypt a value, we'll, um, let's see, we'll do M1 equals, so I, I just, I have, those are just random digits in the, the uh, little scratch file up there, so I'm just gonna do a few more random digits, blah, like that. M2, B, other random digits. M3 is M1 plus M2. And now we'll encrypt each one. The encrypt method requires the public key and the message you want to encrypt. And now I'll show you that, so we can do C3 equals C1 plus C2. So it lets you add ciphertext. Uh, so ciphertext structure is just a dictionary with the key being C and then uh, the value is just a long integer. And if we then decrypt it, actually, yeah, so pi.decrypt, Give it the public key, private key, and C3. I'll show that that's equal to M3. So you can see how this operation does, uh, it really is preserved through the encryption. And this is, can become quite useful in a number of schemes. So um, I think yesterday at, there were multiple talks that talked about homomorphic encryption. Um, I plan on at the end of this one, talking about a protocol that I had worked on with uh, another team um, that did secure text pattern matching using additively homomorphic encryption. So, and one of the crypto systems they used was Pi A. Um, okay. Oh, right. And I'll also just demonstrate that uh, in addition to adding, you can also multiply by uh, plain numbers. So. It will let you, you know, do whatever times C3. Oh, right. This is, one, this is the one where I remember you have to uh, put the number on the, the right side. There you go. Um, so, I mean, all this really means is that you can uh, do linear algebra. You can do matrix multiplication or um, vector math uh, using encrypted values and unencrypted values. Okay, so um, the next thing that I'm just gonna mention uh, are commitment schemes. So commitment schemes allow for zero knowledge proof. So uh, this allows you to uh, say, uh, I'm gonna commit to this value, but I'm not gonna show you what it is first. So it has first a uh, binding property and hiding. So binding just means that I can't, un I can't take back that that value was from me and uh, Hiding means that you won't know what the, mess, the value was until I open the commitment. And they have uh, support in here for Pedersen commitments. So this is just a, a quick um, overview of how Pedersen commitments work. Basically, the way that Pedersen commitment works is that uh, you're going to do like Algamal encryption, and then when you open the uh, commitment, you just give them the private key, and then that allows them to decrypt it and verify that. Oh, uh, you give them the key and 
the, the original message and you can show that they're um, the same thing. Okay. All right, so um, I'll talk a little bit about the, the protocol class and I'm gonna go back and actually just show a little bit how it's structured. So one of the nice things about Charm is that if you have a protocol that involves communication between two parties, then you can just write this in terms of uh, methods that call, uh, just return back values that would get sent back and forth. And it uh, maintains a state machine of where you are in the protocol and handles for you the transport portion. So um, sending and receiving of data. And this also um, can be used as a sub protocol. So you can, um, you can uh, have other protocols within your main protocol and refer back to what you already have contained in, in the bigger protocol. Uh, so well, let's I'll, uh, show the, um, I'm just gonna, no, actually, I'm gonna get out of the presentation mode real quick for just a second. Oh. Oh no, that's the wrong one. Okay. Okay, so um, the first, the, the init method just sets up all the, the sort of the common parameters that both sides of the protocol are gonna have. And then in particular, it has uh, what kind of, what are the party types? So are you gonna refer to it as a sender or receiver or a client and server? And um, the, there's a state machine that uh, you set up in your init method and this self.db just allows you to store data between different uh, method calls. Um, the setup is uh, all the information that tells it which, um, which instance it is, whether it's the server or the client. And um, so th this add instance is just um, used in the um, initialization method. And yeah, it just has a variety of different useful uh, methods that you call to keep track of state, get state at different points send messages and receive messages. So this is one thing that is, uh, was not entirely clear to me when I was first using it. Um, and it takes a bit of work. Um, so this is probably the, part, the hardest part of actually using this protocol class is that, um, so when you initialize the, the class, you can pass it a socket, either a server socket or a client socket, and then it will transmit the data, but you know, Python objects aren't just raw binary, you need to serialize and deserialize it. And it turns out that um, oftentimes it isn't smart enough to just serialize and deserialize all the objects it knows about. So you have to implement some serialization and deserialization to get data back and forth. But once you have uh, the appropriate methods and um, it just looks like uh, passing data back and forth. One uh, stage in the protocol will just be, a will give you a return value and that will end up being the input to the next step in the protocol on the other side, just transparently. Okay. All right. So one of the first types of protocols I'm gonna talk about that uh, is used is uh, called Sigma protocols. And so Sigma protocols, um, they're called Sigma protocols because of this sort of three part structure that looks like the, in, um, in cryptographer's minds, I guess, looks like the um, lines of a, th of a Sigma, a great capital Sigma. Um, and so there are a number of these proofs where you wanna show that you know something about a, a public value without revealing that information. And it follows this general structure of the prover sends some message A, the verifier sends back some string E, 
and then the prover sends a, a Z value and their verifier will either accept or reject the proof based on the values of X, A, E, and Z. And so I'll give you a little bit of an example here. So the first one is, um, this is a discrete log based Sigma protocol. So um, how can I prove to you that I know discrete log of a given group element uh, and the given base uh, without revealing that discrete log. And um, so here what we do is we start with a random exponentiation of, the, of our uh, generator G, and that's our A value. We send that back. The verifier just sends back an E value that's, so this to the T less than size of G, that just means it's just some random value in the, the size of the, the group that we're working with. And then the prover sends back uh, Z equals R plus E W. And if you look, um, since A is G to the R and H was originally G to the W and um, the verifier is gonna compute H to the E power, when you multiply all those together, that should be the same thing as what's on the left side, that G to the Z value. So, uh, this allows you to hide the information about that original exponent in, in the new exponent. Okay. Um, so I'm not gonna quite show that because um, the Sigma protocols aren't um, in charm already, uh, aren't really, were implemented with the intention of being independent protocols. Uh, it turns out that they use those for um, a different protocol called oblivious transfer. And so we'll talk a little bit about oblivious transfer. So um, the idea here is that you have a server, some say a server has multiple messages and a client might want to know what one of those messages is, but they don't want to tell you what that message is and the server doesn't want to re reveal the, um, all the, any other message besides the one that the client's asking for. And um, this, I think, is uh, a very interesting privacy-preserving protocol. Um, you can imagine a number of situations where you want to verify some information about, say, some domain, but you don't want to tell everybody that you want to check out this domain. It might be one that, you know, it, people are like, well, why, why are you looking there? So uh, using oblivious transfer as at least one way that I thought of that you could keep the privacy of this inquiry um, while still being able to satisfy these uh, security considerations of uh, doing validation on the domain. So um, this text just basically says uh, what I was trying to say that, you know, um, in the, the original uh, definition, it was just two messages. It's since been expanded to, um, you can have N messages and allow for up to K uh, requests. And so I'll show you uh, that they implemented um, what was called an, an adaptive oblivious transfer protocol um, in here, and it'll demonstrate a little bit of how the protocol class is used, how it's a subclass uh, in Python. So. Okay, so. All right. Um, so um, you can see the, the first couple of lines um, under the protocol.net um, are talking about what I was saying before about how the um, protocol class maintains a state machine. So the way this works is just by having a dictionary that maps which state you are, which is just a number, to the method that you have to call for the next um, part of the protocol. Um, and, you know, typically it just goes in order one, two, three, four, but um, as you can see, I guess like um, the sender um, has the option of going from three to back to three or three to five. Um, so the dictionary below, the, these are the transitions. So these basically are the, the, the nodes in your state machine. These are the transitions between them. And 
here's where we add the different types of parties, the receiver and sender. Um, you'll notice a lot in Charm, um, a lot of these protocols use pairing groups. So uh, we use a, a pairing group here. And then um, most of the, it, um, oh, so <laughs> these methods right here are actually ones I added uh, because they didn't exist at the time. So when I tried first running this, I found that uh, it would just crash. I was like, what, why? It was saying key error. So what would happen is that um, when, uh, because the, the serialization methods were not actually occurring, it was not actually sending and receiving data, and then it would move on and try to access data that it didn't actually have. So um, I had to go through and, and uh, serialize the data. So more or less um, what should work is you can pickle the data, um, so you can use loads and dumps. Um, however, there are a number of the classes that they have in here, um, pickle can't serialize. Uh, one of them being pairing groups, the integer groups are also ones that just can't pickle, but um, those objects have their own serialization methods, so you can just call the serialize method on, on those, and then it's just a byte string, and you can pickle that. And then um, you can see that, so in this case, the first step in the protocol for the sender, that's the one that has all the messages, is um, to set up these values, and when, it, when a receiver um, first initiates contact, uh, it's gonna say, okay, let's run sigma protocol one, is what it calls it. Um, okay, and they structure all the uh, sender methods together, so you'll see that there's uh, another one that involves, that, where it's gonna do the proving for sigma protocol one. I'll do sigma protocol two, and three, so on and so forth. Um, and then down here uh, are the receiver methods, and it will uh, create the Sigma protocol class and initialize it. Um, and I had to uh, extract out uh, the necessary information for me to actually construct the um, the values that need to go into the Sigma protocol. In this case, the uh, the public key and more or less works that way. Uh, at the bottom, they did uh, allow this to be a script, although I couldn't actually get this to run properly here. So um, I actually, what I did end up doing was, um, mostly because in PyCharm, I haven't found a way to run the same file in, with different parameters at the same time. So I just, I don't know if anybody, does anybody know how to do that? No? Okay. Um, so I just basically created two uh, files that have the same functionality and just one gets the one parameter that gets the other and it implements the um, the protocol and so locks oh yeah yeah so um, I mean I'm not exactly sure so I didn't end up doing that. So what I did was I created two separate files. So um, there's, this one's called uh, Oblivious Transfer Receiver and Oblivious Transfer Sender. And in this case, the receiver acts as a server. So let's hope this one actually works. Did work earlier today. Um, so it's operating a receiver and then um, we'll do the sender. And wow, that went fast. <laughs> so um, it appears to have gone through all the steps and, oh, that's this under here. Um, the receiver said, yep, it looks like the, the protocol completed. So um, this is, uh, with a little bit of work of uh, implementing the serialization and deserialization methods, this protocol is basically ready out of the box uh, in Charm. So, I'm going to now actually talk about that, that protocol that I mentioned earlier. Um, mostly because I, I, I think it's pretty neat and um, uh, I think it, it would lend itself well to um, prototyping in 
in charm here. So when I actually did this, this was a while ago, it was about seven years ago, uh, we did the entire implementation in C++, but we looked into um, a Python-based, uh, well, it was a, a Python derivative um, called TastyL, um, and Tasty stood for something, something about multi-party computation, I think. Um, I mentioned it in my talk last year, so I forgot what it stands for off the top of my head. Um, but I think we always had problems getting it to actually work and compile. This uh, should actually work. I haven't fully finished getting it to work, but I'm gonna just quickly explain how the protocol works. Um, so, uh, this, uh, what we're, we're trying to do here is we have a server that has some body of text and you wanna run a, a query on some sort of wildcard based expression. Um, so you can think of um, like grep with, uh, without, uh, or like a regular expression without allowing for multiple characters. Like you need to know exactly how many characters you're looking for, but you can, you could in principle um, ask for, say I want a pattern where like the, the first character is um, A through F and the second character is, you know, um, B through G or something like that. And, um, and then maybe the rest of them are all fixed characters and Maybe, or maybe, you know, you'll have just a, it can be anything wildcard star character, um, and this protocol should work. So, um, the idea here is that, um, what you're gonna do is, uh, for each letter in your pattern, you're gonna construct what, uh, we call, so this is a CDV, a character delay vector. The idea is that, let's assume that if we find that letter in the, the text we're searching, that it's part of our pattern, then how far away would we have to go until we reach the end of the pattern? So, and we're gonna say, um, we're gonna go that much further and put a one there. And um, in the end, we should end up with uh, a total of, like say for this pattern of T-A-C-T, uh, of tact, uh, we'll get a four in the location where the, the pattern is found. Um, so I'll just go through real quick um, explaining this. So when you construct the, the CDV, you'll see the, you first have a T here. That corresponds with this one here, the one at the end, because that's saying that if this is that T, then we have to wait three more characters before we get to our pattern. And then if you get to see an A, that means, okay, if that was part of the pattern, there need, well, we have to wait two more characters. I'll be over here. The C is, C corresponds to this one, and this T corresponds to this one right here. That's saying we found, we're there, right? If, if the T we're on is that one, we're, we're done. And then what you do is you start off with um, what we call an activation vector, and we go through each letter in the text and, and look at the corresponding character delay vector and add that chunk um, to the vector and keep moving forward. So, and then shift one over. So uh, G had an all zero vector, so nothing happens here. The A has a zero, zero, one, zero, so we get a one over here. There's this T, another T here, A, C, T. Okay, and what happens is, um, see this one, as I, get, I said, corresponded to the end of the pattern and it landed right here where that's the length of the pattern you want. Um, if you want a wildcard situation, then you actually um, do that by saying, I'm gonna look for one less. So say instead of uh, looking for tact, I, was, I just wanted TA and then it could be anything, A, G, A, C, G, and T, then uh, instead of looking for a four, I'd look for a three. And um, this actually comes from uh, what I think are called time-delayed neural networks. That, that's where this terminology comes from of activation vectors. So um, the whole idea being that the, the activation vector is how much time is delayed between when it sees it and when this uh, neuron fires, but um, 
my colleagues realized, well, we could just, we can sort of borrow that concept and apply it here in this way. Okay. So in, uh, in this protocol, what we do is we use an additively homomorphic encryption scheme. Um, it can be pi A, there's an additive algamol or an elliptic curved algamol. Um, and one of the things that's nice about this protocol is we make a few tweaks um, to allow us to use those bottom two. Um, and that is that uh, instead of actually looking for four, what we do is we subtract by the, the four that we're looking for in every single spot. And that means we're look, really looking for zero. Uh, so what happens in, in our secure version is we do all this homomorphically. So when, what the server will do is it will generate this an, a, initial activation vector by creating a, an encryption of all zeros. Um, and they'll all look different because uh, it's a, a um, probabilistic encryption scheme. And then um, the query that you send is going to be encryptions of all these values. So this, these are all going to be encrypted values. And the server won't be able to tell whether this is a zero or one. But because of the homomorphic nature of it, uh, you can add and effectively subtract. And so we'll get back down here where this one will be zero. And then um, the, this protocol, the secure text pattern matching, adds a few extra steps to um, make sure that we don't leak any additional information. So what we also do is we multiply by random values. So um, anything else will become random except for the zeros, because anything times zero is zero. And, um, and then you can also shuffle around the values. So you can't, so ultimately what you, you get is you find out how many times that pattern showed up in the text, but not where. And you don't learn anything about, um, like so in this protocol right here, you could learn that, you could get some information about how far off the text was at each location from your pattern. But by doing this, um, so right, the subtracting by four is, a, um, is just to allow us to do a blinding step of just multiplying that destroys the information of the other ones and then the shuffling um, just eliminates the information about where you found it. Um, so I was hoping to uh, actually demo this in Charm, but uh, those serialization issues uh, have been dogging me, so don't quite have it uh, working right now. But um, I can show you basically um, the structure of it. So uh, okay, so I um, I wasn't I don't I wasn't sure if there was any way for me to just have one step on the server because really there's only one step. Um, each step is um, a uh, between communication. So it uh, will either receive information and then send or um, do everything inside that. So um, since all that happens is the, the server receives an encrypted request and then returns back a encrypted, encrypted uh, reply, um, there's really only one step here, but I put basically a dummy step here that just returns none um, there, but, okay, so, go back up to the um, init method. So here, you know, I, again, have my, my states, my transitions, add parties, do all that kind of stuff. Um, if you notice the, in the diagram I had before, it was using an alphabet of A, C, G, and T. Um, and that was because one of the original applications of this protocol was for um, privacy preserving searches of uh, DNA. So I think one of the applications they were, were saying is, that they suggested um, was uh, you might have some researchers who know some gene mutations that make you more prone to cancer. Um, You'd like to know, hey, am I more likely to have cancer? But you don't want other people to know what the answer is, right? Because that could um, mess with your insurance or anything like that. So you get your gene sequenced, you encrypt 
the uh, you encrypt your DNA in this special way, send the response back, and then you can see if um, the appropriate genes match um, any of the patterns they have. Um, so in this case, um, I just tried to keep it to a relatively small alphabet of just ASCII letters, digits, some white space and punctuation, um, but I also allow you to specify the alphabet if you want. And um, the init method, um, you know, has two other uh, parameters. One is a text file, so that's the text that's on the server side and the query. So only one, only the server is going to fill in that one, and only the client is going to fill in the query parameter there. Um, and then um, I just have a few helper methods here. This one constructs the character delay vectors. Um, this one does the encryption. Uh, this does the, the searching on the server side. So this does all the homomorphic encryption, or homomorphic operations. Um, and it does you know, the blinding uh, and the shuffling. And then uh, in the actual, uh, for the actual steps of the protocol, the client you know, just first generates a key, it constructs the character delay vector and sends both um, the character or not both all of the the character delay vector, the pattern length, and um, the uh, public key, uh, and then um, what it expects back is an encrypted activation vector, and it just does a search through that to see are any of those do any of those values decrypt to zero, and if it does, it'll print pattern found. Otherwise, uh, pattern not found. So, um, unfortunately, my demo is not quite working. Um, so I'll basically leave it there. Um, I think we have a few minutes for questions. If anybody has any. Um, but other than that, I think that's all I've got. So, thank you.